All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the ARCS National Center on Criminal Justice and Disabilities first webinar in our 2017 Policing People with Disabilities series. My name is Ariel Sims, and I'm the Criminal Justice Fellow here at NCCJD. Please uh, forgive my voice from time to time. You might hear a little squeak uh, or something of that nature. Uh, I started losing it last night, and uh, it has not markedly improved, so please forgive that. Um, and before we get into the meat of our presentation, I just wanted to cover a few basics, um, including logistics, for those of you who may be new to WebEx. Okay. If you're participating, if you're kind of listening in, you are going to be in listen-only mode. You will be muted, and we won't hear you. If you are having any technology issues while you're listening to the webinar or watching the webinar, please call the WebEx help desk at the number shown on the slide, and it's also in the chat box. Um, if you would like to access live captioning during the webinar, just copy and paste the link I provided on the slide and in the chat box into a new browser, and then you can pull up the captioning service and the webinar side by side. So our webinar today is going to start with a series of speakers. At the end of the individual presentation, I will ask the panelists to participate in a general discussion. At the end of this session, there will be time for questions from our participants in the audience. You can post your questions in the Q&A section on WebEx, also on the right-hand side of your screen. If you don't want your name shared with your question later on, just type the word private before you type the question. You can also email questions to us directly at nccjdinfo at thearc.org, and that'll show up later on in the presentation in case you prefer to use email. And if we don't get to your question during the presentation itself, we'll make sure that we follow up with you afterwards. Uh, important note that this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted on our website along with the PowerPoint slides and a transcript about a week from today. One last logistical request. A short survey will pop up after the webinar has ended. Please take just five minutes at the end of the webinar to complete it. This really helps ensure that you're satisfied with future NCCJD webinars and provides valuable feedback to us as well as our panelists. And this webinar is funded by the United States Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. I think that just about covers the logistics. So with that, I just want to tell you a little bit more about NCCJD. Um, in our 2017 Policing People with Disabilities webinar series. Um, the National Center was created back in 2013 with a grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We advocate at the intersection of criminal justice reform and the advancement of disability rights. And something a little more unique about our center is that we work both on the victim witness side of the, of the criminal justice system, but also with those who may be facing charges or are incarcerated um, in the United States. Our overarching goal and mission is to build the capacity of the criminal justice system to respond to gaps in existing services for people with disabilities. And as we are part of the ARC, we have a focus on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you can see that we do a variety of activities, including training, technical assistance, resource collection, publication, and education. All right. This is the first webinar in our 2017 Policing People with Disabilities series. And we plan to provide an overview of police use of force against persons with disabilities and other marginalized populations, including women of color. But first, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge that this conversation can be a difficult one um, when we're talking about the topic of police use of force. Um, our goal in hosting this webinar is really to bring together a variety of perspectives to start addressing this problem. More importantly, um, here at NCCJD, we really wanted to step outside our traditional focus on disability to acknowledge the truly intersectional nature of this issue. To that end, we have invited an impressive group of panelists to educate us on this topic. You can see their names here up on the slide. Um, just a quick note that um, Kimberly Crenshaw was not able to join us, but we are so fortunate to have um, another representative from the African American Policy Forum with us today, Janine Jackson. Okay. 
this first webinar is uh, the goal is mostly to focus on the overarching problem, um, kind of figure out what it is and educate people who may not be aware of the issue. Um, and then we hope to use our second and third webinars in the series, uh, the Policing People with Disabilities series, to highlight potential solutions from around the country, ranging from community-based programs to emerging employment opportunities for people with disabilities in law enforcement themselves. Uh, we do hope you will join us for those conversations as we try to shift from the problem to potential solutions. And also, if you know of a unique program or policy that's addressing this particular issue and the intersectionality piece of that, please share that with us um, with that email address that's listed on the slide, the nccgdinfo at the arc.org. Right, finally, I just wanted to lay down a couple of basic group norms given the difficult nature of this conversation just to make sure that we're having the most productive discussion possible. And then you can see those here on the slide. We just want everyone to be present and engaged in the discussion. It's a, it's a tough topic, but it's really important. We want to make sure everyone's engaged. Um, you know, we're, we might hear some ideas that not everyone agrees with, and I would just ask that as a norm, we just um, we challenge the idea not the person and really have a norm of curiosity about um, that particular idea. We're also going to hear a variety of perspectives on the webinar today. Um, perspectives on the problem, perspectives on how we might approach a different solution. Um, so just a quick note that, you know, every perspective is valid and I think, you know, there's something that we can learn from each of those perspectives as they're presented. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to introduce you to Leanne Davis. Leanne Davis is the Director of the Criminal, of Criminal Justice Initiatives here at the ARC, as well as Director of the National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability, and she's going to share some opening remarks with us. All right, thank you, Ariel, um, and thank you for your work in coordinating this webinar and laying out the ground rules for us. And uh, I would also like to thank our panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be here today and everyone who's joined us on the webinar for this important discussion. We really hope to hear from many of you during the Q&A portion of the webinar. So before we hear from our speakers today, I want to briefly uh, give a background about why NCCJD decided to focus on this topic of intersectionality. In addition to holding a webinar on this topic, we'll also be including this issue um, in our 2017 white paper on policing people with disabilities. So as Ariel said, my name is Leanne Davis and I'm the Director of Criminal Justice, Justice Initiatives here at the ARC. And in that role, I oversee MCCJD. And with over 20 years of experience working in the area of criminal justice and disability issues, I've had the incredible opportunity to work alongside people with disabilities and professionals and family members and others just like you who are working to ensure that people with disabilities have equal access to justice, whether they're suspects or victims or defendants. So given that we recently um, celebrated Martin Luther King, um, Martin Luther King Day, I wanted to begin my comments with one of his quotes. And that is, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. So that's a profound thought, not being silent about things that matter. This is the philosophy that NCCJD strives to live by. We purposefully set out to uncover and demystify topics that may be viewed as unimportant, controversial, or just too complicated to address. And at the end of the day, our primary goal is to provide a platform for people with disabilities and others who are often marginalized in our society to be heard and supported and then validated. So Dr. King's quote also serves as a springboard to other important questions that we want to know about and that we're also posing to you today. So as you listen to our speakers, just be thinking about uh, these questions and mulling them over in your mind. So first of all, how and why are we silent about this issue? How are people with disabilities included or excluded when it comes to these kinds of discussions? What are we afraid of uncovering if we dig a bit deeper below the surface? For example, are we afraid of finding out about our own 
um, unconscious biases, or are we afraid we might have to work to change them? And then what tools can be used to create authentic, genuine communication, which can lead to more genuine and authentic uh, communities and environments in those communities? So since the establishment of NCCJD in 2013, we've become increasingly interested in this issue. And there's really two reasons for that, and I wanted to address those quickly. Um, one is because we're working on developing law enforcement training, and specifically training for um, crisis intervention teams. And these are specific um, this, this, these are specific teams that work within police departments that focus on the issue of psychiatric disabilities. Sometimes intellectual and development, developmental disabilities are addressed, but most of the focus is on psychiatric illnesses. And so uh, we are working to really bring in more of a conversation around people with all types of disabilities, include, including intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we, we want to be able to address this with police departments nationwide about how our own biases can affect how we treat people who are not like us. And so that's one reason why we wanted to focus on this topic specifically, but also because we um, have a national information and referral service where we get calls from all, all over the country from different people with disabilities and family members, attorneys, and others in the system. And through one of those calls, we came across the case of um, Reginald Nellie Latson. Um, and some of these cases have involved people that really have biases in more than one way. And this one really stands out because of um, our work with the Arc of Virginia and many other advocates who clearly saw the issue of autism um, in this case, and yet the court system and those involved in the criminal justice system really didn't look deeply at this issue. So we worked with the Arc of Virginia and other disability groups on, on this case. And Mr. Lassen was caught in a recurring cycle of prosecution and punishment due to factors that were really related to his disability. His harrowing experience began in May of 2010 when he was standing in front of a local library wearing a hoodie and a police officer wanted to question him because they were looking for an African American man with a gun. Lassen has autism and of course became fearful about this and then he began acting violently which then caused serious injuries to the officer. This led to him being questioned, uh, being placed in jail, where he then was placed in solitary confinement for most of the time during his sentencing. And this was not the man that police were looking for, and yet he ended up confined in the criminal justice system for far too long. It actually took a conditional pardon by the governor to finally free Mr. Lassen. So it's stories like these, and this story is also included in um, a publication that one of our panelists today, David Perry, will be speaking to you about. But there's many other cases like these across the country where we have to really start uncovering the intersectionality of these issues. And it's our hope at NCCJD that we will be able to start that conversation here once again uh, using this webinar and um, that we will be able to hear from many of you at the end of the webinar and ideas on how we can really start to begin having better conversations around this that can uh, result in better solutions. So thank you for joining us today and uh, I look forward to hearing from all of our panelists now. Thank you. Ariel, I can't hear you. Sorry, you um, sorry, sorry about that. that. Um, just to let everybody know, um, Laurel Kilpatrick, who was our first speaker, hasn't been able to join us just yet, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, um, and we'll start with Janine Jackson. So, Janine, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your camera. And I will make, give you presenter privileges so you can move the slides back and forth. Cool. 
Janine, I don't think we can hear you just yet. Here I am. Can you hear me? Um, there, there, there we go. Okay. And now you have control over this slide, so just use those arrows to go back and forth. Okay. So should that mean you'll forgive my slide ignorance here? I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing control of my slides. I still see the Nellie Latson slide. Okay. I have Let's some arrows. One second. Forgive the audience here for, <laughs> I'm going back to slide one. I mean, part, there we go. Okay, there we, there's right. your slide. And then, um, so I'll just move forward as I, as I want to advance them, is that correct? Yeah, yep, the arrow's All just right. right overhead the top of the slide. All right then, uh, well, without, uh, without further ado, uh, I'm happy to get started. My name, I'm a, I'm a board member at the African American Policy Forum, and I work with that group on media research. Uh, on behalf of the African American Policy Forum, as well as for myself, I'm very pleased to be part of this void-filling conversation. Intersectionality, which Leanne has just mentioned, is the term coined by African American Policy Forum co-founder, law professor, and legal theorist Kimberly Crenshaw. And it's turning up more often in conversation these days, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that term's origin and its function. Professor Crenshaw was struck by the story of a woman named Emma de Graffin Reed. She was a black woman who applied to work at a car manufacturing plant and was denied work, she believed, uh, due to discrimination. Her lawsuit, the lawsuit that she filed, was thrown out, however, by the judge, and the reasoning was what was so interesting. The judge, the, the, it was ruled that uh, DeGraff and Reed could not show racial bias because the car manufacturing plant hired African American men uh, for industrial work, for maintenance work, and she could not argue sex bias because the plant hired white women, uh, usually for secretarial or for front office work. And the judge said specifically that it would be unfair for DeGraff and Reed to combine two causes of action. He said that would be like giving her two swings at the bat when African American men and white women only got one. So the point is, it wasn't simply that de Graffin Reed was in reality discriminated against. It was that because of the way she was discriminated against, her problem was not just invisible, but you could say erased. There was no legal frame to hold her experience, the way those two biases compounded. And what we find is that if you don't have a conceptual frame to hold a problem, then it's very difficult, if not uh, impossible, to address it. And so the African American Policy Forum has worked very hard to integrate this idea of intersectionality into debate and policy and activism in a number of issue areas, but in particular in the area of police or state violence and people of color. Our Say Her Name campaign is a multi-year, multi-front effort to increase awareness of and response to the abuse, including lethal, uh, of African American women by law enforcement. It includes research and activism and media and policy work. Uh, we often begin conversations, though, with an exercise in which the audience is asked to stand up, and a list of names is then read, and when folks hear a name they do not recognize, they're asked to sit down. So it will begin Michael Brown, and most folks stay standing, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice. With each name, more and more folks will sit down, but then when the speaker says Sandra Bland, it starts to shift. Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, after just a few of those names, most of the group is seated. And it doesn't matter if these are law students or women's rights advocates. It really doesn't matter who the audience is. It 
physically illustrates the gulf that exercise does between the public awareness of African American men who are killed by law enforcement and that of African American women. And the reality is that African American women are also killed disproportionately in unacceptable numbers and in situations that should spark equal outrage. Some statistics there, but again, the issue seems to be one of framing. We have a picture of who is being killed by police, of who is vulnerable, and that picture is of a black man. Black women don't fit in that frame except as um, you know, grieving mothers or sisters or, or community members. And that's what the Say Her Name campaign is about. And, and, and it's true, this framing issue, not just for media, which I focus on, but also for policymakers and even also for activists and advocates. And what it means concretely is that many black women's deaths are ignored. Um, their families are denied that measure of solace that comes with having people go out in the street and say never again. You know, and that's a real thing. But it also means that the dimensions of the problem are being mismeasured. The specificity of people's experiences is being missed. And so those experiences aren't being used to help shape our social and our policy response. So, for example, black trans women have been singled out for victimization by law enforcement on the basis of race and class and gender orientation, and in the case of sex workers and occupation. It's not just one of those identities or qualities, but it's their intersection. And you can't simply stir their experience into some sweeping definition of the problem whose face is that of a young black man. So I think we can see the relevance of this uh, for our efforts to address the role of disability in incidents of police misconduct. And indeed, um, the list in the Say Her Name report includes Sharice Francis, a woman with schizophrenia whose family reached out to police when she was off her medication and was especially uh, distraught. When she refused initially to go to the hospital, uh, she was pinned down on the sidewalk by four officers, one with a knee in her back, and she stopped breathing during that altercation. Kayla Moore, a transgender black woman whose roommate called police for help when she was in mental health crisis. Instead, the police who arrived tried to arrest Moore on a warrant for a man 20 years her senior, but who shared the name she'd been given at birth. Kayla Moore was suffocated in her bedroom, um, after which officers failed to administer adequate treatment and continued to call her transgender slurs. Uh, the list also includes Michelle Cousseau. She was killed by a police officer called to transfer her to a mental health facility. The officer acknowledged that uh, Michelle hadn't physically threatened him, but he said that she had that anger in her face, like she was going to hit someone. So he shot her in the heart. With people with disabilities, as with black women, when we're talking about this question of uh, police misconduct, there are commonalities. For example, there's an absence of basic data, and I know that uh, David Perry is going to address that as one of the real void fillers in terms of missing data. There's an absence of basic data being collected, and it's very hard to address a problem when you can't see it, when you can't see its shape, its outlines. But there's also a need for more understanding of how these marginalities or vulnerabilities reinforce one another. They don't simply combine. So what's the connection, for example, between cases of people with mental disabilities being killed by police in a community and the availability of healthcare resources in that community, right? And what's the relationship between the availability of healthcare resources and the racial makeup of that community? These things are, are integrated. How does what we know about implicit racial bias, seeing black people as bigger or more powerful or impervious to pain, these ideas that we've heard about implicit racial bias, how does that combine with the tendency by law enforcement to read noncompliance as threat? 
And is it too much to imagine that a non-compliant black person is read as more threatening than a non-compliant white person? And of course, different sorts of disabilities are going to require different sorts of understanding. So we have an urgent need for concepts and for narratives that make it possible to hold more than one thing at once, right? And that move us away from the idea of zero-sum justice, in which concern for one group precludes or, or sets aside till later, you know, the same thing, concern for other groups. And I want to talk at that point um, about uh, Michelle Cusso's mother, Fran Garrett, who exemplifies in a way the work that's being done. Uh, she, as the slide indicates, has taken the pain of her daughter's death and has put it has translated it, has worked with it into working for changes in police training and in hiring since her death. And she has had an impact in the adoption of measures by, as you see, the police department. Um, if we are going to point to training, for example, for officers about ways of engaging people with disabilities, intersectionality demands that this training be transformative, that it make these concerns part of the core work, right? It can't be that you learn policing and then for extra credit you do 10 hours about working with people with disabilities. No, that won't do. It has to be at the core of the work. It has to be integrated with a recognition that racial biases, for example, and anti-disability biases and gender biases, again, don't just combine but compound. And finally, I would say, um, so of course, I'm looking forward to talking, answering questions and the conversation later, but I would want to end by saying that officer training, while necessary, is not sufficient. There needs to be a multidimensional approach, as I think Michelle Cusso's mother is showing. There needs to be a multidimensional approach that includes improved social services and resources, that in, incorporates the fight to end discrimination on all fronts, and that includes a vision of restorative justice, where those who have been victims are listened to and are leaders in bringing about the change that we seek. So I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you, and I will, I'll end right there. All right, thank you so much, Janine. We really appreciate that. Um, so up next, we're going to turn things over to David Perry. Uh, David M. Perry is a disability rights journalist and professor of history at Dominican University. He's also a columnist for Pacific Standard Magazine and has recent bylines at outlets including CNN, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and Vice. Uh, so with that, David, we'll turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm assuming everything is working just fine, but someone will tell me if it isn't. It's really an honor to be on this panel. And um, let's see if I can advance. There we go. This slide. Uh, I, I have a number of things to say. Mostly I'm going to really just focus on the media issue uh, as opposed to the whole picture and, and really zero in right on there. Although I do want to pick up what Janine just said that there's a lot of narratives both within the media but also within government and within disability rights groups and with police reform groups that the solution to this problem is to put in more crisis intervention team training. Certainly the city of Chicago where I live is investing millions of dollars in that and crisis intervention team training is something we'll talk about more. You'll hear more about it. Uh, if you pay attention to this issue in the news, you'll hear about it constantly. It's not a bad thing, but everything that Janine just said about um, that solutions have to be intersectional as well. Uh, I just want to, to endorse that. I've, in fact, traveled around the country. I've gone to a lot of different kinds of trainings and none of them are bad, uh, but none of them are really solutions on their own either. With that, I thought I'd move forward to talking a little bit about the media issues because uh, both our media culture uh, as well as our broader culture, of course, resists this kind of intersectional approach uh, that Janine has just talked about. Uh, I, I'm a journalist. I write a lot about disability rights issues as well as other issues. I think like a lot of uh, white 
middle class parents of children with disabilities. I came into this issue through the death of Ethan Saylor, a young man, 26, with Down syndrome, who was killed in a suburban mall in Maryland by off-duty police officers. But quite quickly, and I hope this is true for most people, uh, came to see this as part of a, a much bigger project, and a project on which the kind of grassroots activists that, again, were just, were just talked about, ha have been, had to work on for, for decades, uh, decades and decades. And uh, we have to both kind of center their efforts and, and honor their work as we go forward. And I'm hoping that Laurel Kilpatrick, who, who does that kind of activism, uh, does make it to the, to the webinar. In the meantime, though, thanks to the rise of ubiquitous video, whether private cell phones or surveillance or formal police body and vehicle cameras, matched with the, the pretty new power that otherwise marginalized groups have found to move media narratives via social media in particular, police violence in America has, as, as I think everyone on this uh, webinar knows, become a new kind of national story. It's not that there weren't stories about police violence before the rise of video. We can look back to the Rodney King uh, beating, which of course was caught on video, but that the, the, the frequency and rapidity with which these kinds of uh, local stories can become national is certainly unprecedented. The violence itself is not unprecedented, and historians and police experts debate what's new and what's just more on camera, and that's not, I think, a debate we need to have here. But clearly, we are in the midst of a long, complicated, often quite divisive conversation around the police use of force in America, and particularly around issues of race. What we in the disability rights community need to do uh, is, is two things. First, we need to uh, join in the broader civil rights conversation while also asserting and recognizing the fact that disability is a major part of this conversation. We need to communicate that message outwards to people not within the disability rights world, but also inwards to say that if what you really care about is disability rights in America, you need to think about issues of state violence, whether police or in the uh, carceral system or otherwise. So that's kind of the big picture. The problem is we don't really have great information, and we don't have good information in general about the police use of force uh, across the country in any context. But certainly disability has not been well tracked, and we don't have, we just don't have the data we'd like to do that kind of sophisticated data analysis uh, that social scientists are particularly fond of and often, often really reveal important findings about our society as a result. When it comes to the media, moreover, which is another place you can go for data, and the media-driven databases, particularly the Washington Post and the Guardians, are based on just surveying other media reports and then trying to cover it. Again, we find that disability is either written out or covered fairly, pro fairly problematically. And so you can see that uh, on my slide here that disability tends to be treated in the following ways. It either goes unmentioned or it's just listed as a fact, a description, a description. He was 5'10", he was black, he had a disability, uh, but without any real interrogation of, of how that disability might have functioned within the incident. Uh, and, and those functions are, are broad and complicated in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, sometimes it's used as an impairment to evoke pity or sympathy in a way that the, oh, because that person was disabled, we should feel bad for them, as opposed to the other people killed by police who are not known to be disabled, so we don't have to feel as bad for them. Again, that's the implicit narrative within a lot of media reports, speaking fairly generally. Uh, and then all too often, and, and I suppose worst, is the use of some kind of description of disability, particularly but not exclusively mental illness, to blame victims for their death. And one of the examples I'd like to go to is Eric Garner, the African-American man uh, killed in the chokehold uh, in New York in uh, 2014. I guess it has been that long. Um, I think it was 2014, excuse me if that's, if that's incorrect. I didn't write that down. Um, but the people who criticized, who, who did not want to criticize the NYPD, said it wasn't the NYPD that killed him, it was his heart disease, it was his obesity, it was his health, it was his disabilities that killed him. And certainly people who are defenders of police conduct said that, but that was also implied within a lot of the media coverage. And that's fairly typical. Uh, a police officer will say, and the journalist will report, I gave him orders to comply, he didn't comply, so I had to use lethal force. And then later we discover that person was in a mental health crisis, or that person was deaf, 
uh, and so may not have heard the orders to comply, or that person was autistic and so may not have chosen to comply in that given in, in exactly the right way in which an officer said. But the reporting around it will end up blaming the media. So we think you can we can do better. In uh, Last year, I was involved in the production of a white paper supported by the Ruderman Family Foundation, uh, and I'm, of course, thankful for their support, in which we looked at 369 cases from uh, January 2013 to December 2015 um, of people with disabilities who had been killed by police, including some deaths in custody and deaths, deaths in prison. And when we're having this conversation about police use of force, Please remember there's a whole nother conversation that people are, are working on and writing about and, and advocating for around um, custody issues and, and, and the carceral system that is uh, linked to this one. So we read 379 articles. We found consistent patterns of no mention of disability, a medicalized description of disability as something that people were suffering from, which may or may not be the case, but I always like to say that you know, what people are suffering from in the moment of their death is not their disability, but the bullet that is entering their body or the arm around their throat or the taser that's, that's uh, stopping their heart or blaming disability for, um, for the violence. Out of this white paper and in general through my journalism uh, and through the work of lots of people working on this, uh, but my, my goal has been to really teach local reporters, not the big columnists in the New York Times, not the people on Fox News or CNN, but the local reporters in your local communities working for uh, the, the network affiliates, working on beat, beat cop reporters for your papers, really just one fact and one better practice. And I think we're doing pretty well on the fact uh, but, and not as well on the practice. The fact, as you can see here, is that a third to a half of all people killed by police have disabilities. That is a huge number, it is a vague number, it is the best number that our current data allows, uh, but I'm pretty confident in it, that a third to a half of all people killed by police have disabilities. And I think once you start looking for it, you will now see that fact appearing in, in your local Channel 9 news. Uh, and I think we've done, done a good job at helping local reporters create context for individual tragedies. Second though, the practice, is that reporters need to reach out to local disability rights groups from the affected communities. And by affected, I mean if it, this is, a, 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 as with Keith Scott, a person, of, a, a person of color with a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, they should be talking to people in uh, North Carolina about traumatic brain injuries. They should be talking to the black community there, there the, as locally as possible, uh, who have these lived experiences who are advocating on these issues and make sure that their voices are centered in every cover in all the coverage. And I think we're a long way from achieving that, but that is the one fact and the one practice. Beyond that, and this is the last things uh, that, that I'll say here, um, as I started, I, I would really like us to regard the more training, the skepticism, uh, a lot of the things that would make a difference are fundamental to police attitudes and could be built in from the ground up. And this is, to some extent, a zero-sum game. If you're spending a million dollars on police training, you are not spending that million dollars on building community mental health clinics or funding preventative care or jobs or any number of other things. Certainly in Chicago, we've seen huge investments in police and not huge investments in communities. Uh, I'm trying to help journalists learn not to assume that disability equals suffering and to be very thoughtful about how they quote people, and then finally to say the word, and this is uh, really Lawrence Carter Long from the National Council on Disabilities, hashtag, um, to say the word disability, not special needs, not other euphemisms. So those are my big points about the media coverage, and again, thanks for having me on this, and I look forward to the further discussion. All right, thank you so much, David. Um, Ron, we're gonna go to you next. Um, it sounds like Laurel, Still might be able to join us, but she is going to be running a little bit late. So we're going to turn things over to you, Ron. Um, and just for so our audience knows, um, Ron doesn't have a webcam, so you won't see Ron, but you should be able to hear Ron for his presentation. Okay. All right, can so with that, Ron, go ahead. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, I too am honored to be uh, to participate in this program today. And uh, uh, agree with a lot of the things that have been said, uh, particularly what David was talking about around the training issues. Uh, it's not going to be solved by training alone, uh, and there should be a great deal of money that's, that needs to be challenged and invested in 
the uh, the mental health community and mental health services and the availability and access to mental health services. Let me start by saying that uh, I'm here today representing the uh, a couple of things, really, uh, the National Police Accountability Project, which I serve on the advisory board of. Uh, uh, it's obvious, uh, it may not be obvious, but I'm also a retired police officer. I worked in the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. for 24 years, some 20 years ago, but still been very active uh, in policing. Uh, I don't like to use the word reform. I use, I use the word restructuring because uh, we have been reforming police departments for over 40 years only to be in the same place we were when we started this discussion. Uh, I've also uh, served as executive director of the National Hi, Ron. Yes, ma'am. Ron, this is Leanne. Can you speak up just a bit? We have some people having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've also, uh, I was saying that I served as a police officer for 24 years. Uh, and I've been retired for almost as many years. Uh, I've also served as the executive director of the National Black Police Association. Uh, and uh, I have a son who is a person with autism. So all of this is very personal to me, too. Uh, and uh, presently serving as president of the D.C. Autism Society. And so these, uh, the intersexuality that uh, that uh, Ms. Jackson was talking about, I live with all of the time because all of these things are very connected for me. Um, we as an autism group, for example, have been uh, working on these issues and have adopted some strategies as it relates to the, as it relates to the police. Like we don't believe in calling the police. We have created uh, family trees, uh, parent trees where we call each other. Because, for example, my son is uh, six feet and weighs 220 pounds, and he doesn't talk, but uh, he has those typical kind of behaviors and characteristics of a man with autism. And so those kind of characteristics and behavior can get you shot uh, pretty much like the young man down in uh, Virginia did, although he wasn't shot, but he was arrested. So we don't, we don't believe in calling the police for a long time now. We have practiced calling each other calling parents to get them to come over to help with our with our with our loved ones when it comes to this because the police even though we even though we have approached them and talked to them about preparation and training and here they have some crisis stuff and supposedly training but it hasn't been active it hasn't been uh the kind of training that has benefited uh young people with uh young people with disabilities like autism and others. So there's also, uh, we've worked on that for a long time and believe in that. Uh, we believe, along with others in the uh, mental health community, that police aren't able and shouldn't be responding to calls for service. There are a couple of projects in the country where mental health, uh, mental health workers are responding and police back them up. And, and I think we would like to see that here as well as in other places because uh, again, a point that David make, it's not just the training, it's the culture of the organization, it's what they've been doing. And to some extent, even though their police departments have invested millions of dollars in training, police officers sort of see training as something they spend the, the week doing so they don't have to work on the street and don't necessarily take that serious when we talk about uh, changing attitudes and practices and behavior as it relates to people with disabilities. That's really important. Uh, and so, uh, again, there's just been uh, a lot of attention to this. I remember spending several uh, days at the White House this past summer and last year meeting with and being a part of discussions on this issue because it was also part of the President's 21st Century Community Policing Project, and there were recommendations that were made in those settings and then hopefully forward and then included in the in the 54 recommendations. And then lastly, I would say that as a result, because uh, we believe we have to be working on solutions, we have been talking about what we call community community control of the police. It's simply what community control of the police uh, is that uh, the community is involved in control, uh, oversight of the police, and not just in terms of discipline, but in terms of setting policies and practices, in terms of 
uh, hiring and find the police chief, developing policies involved in the training of police officers. And in that concept, there's also this notion that we look at the institutions that have this intersexuality that Ms. Jackson was talking about and David was talking about because those are the things that really make a difference. See, if we don't talk about uh, community being involved in developing policies and practices as it relates to how mental health services get delivered in the community and what that looks like, uh, how that looks when we talk about schools, because a lot of our young black men and women uh, enter the criminal justice system as a result of what happens in school. You know, police officers, uh, I'm opposed to police officers working in schools. I think they ought to uh, respond to schools to provide, say, workshops and things, but they shouldn't be stationed in schools because school administrators tend to use them for discipline rather than the school involved in some form of discipline. So we, we, we see community control of the police as a comprehensive approach to the intersectionality and being involved in it because we can't just oversee policing without overseeing mental health, without overseeing schools, without overseeing the other institutions that 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 uh that are in our community that the police sometimes get called to respond to our homes and neighbors uh homes to, to provide services that really they shouldn't be responding to there should be other individuals and other institutions or representatives of those institutions responding to those services, for the, all those calls for service. So those are the kind of things. I, I, I just, uh, I, I remember back in when that situation happened in in Dallas and Chief Brown talked about that police are called on to do things that they shouldn't. I totally agree, but that's not a new conversation. We have been talking about that for a long time. Because we, we we should be working and talking about getting the police out of our community versus uh, having them involved more in our community. Because the more they're involved in our community, the more we're going to see the bias and the racism and discrimination is going to manifest itself in the kind of way that jacks up and creates the mass incarceration that we're involved in now. Uh, We've we've experienced some de incarceration, but if we continue to think that the the solution is in the police and them uh, solving our problems, then that those numbers are going to radically go up again. So we have to start talking about alternatives, and we're going to have to step up to the plate involved in that process to to uh, interpret those issues in our community too. We can't run away from them. We need to seriously be involved in it and control more of the issues that affect. Uh, the institutions and their response in our community. And uh, again, this uh, really excited about the opportunity to uh, to bring this to this discussion, and as well as uh, participate in the uh, in the dialogue uh, uh, now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Ron. Uh, we're still trying to get Laurel on on the webinar. I'm not sure if she's gonna quite make it, but um, we were gonna turn to some general discussion next between the panelists, so I think we can still get started with that. And um, a couple of things, uh, you know, for Janine, for David, for Ron, um, I'm hoping you can maybe take a few minutes to respond to one another and what you might have heard. And also maybe look at this question here that, you know, we know, what the problem is, you know, we've talked about the problem, we see that, uh, where do we go from here? Um, as advocates, as criminal justice professionals, as family members, as people with disabilities, um, where do you think we go from here? So uh, for this part of the, the webinar, I just have you guys all turn on your video cameras and unmute yourselves and then what will happen is whoever's speaking that video will track to the person speaking. You want to take this one first, Janine? Uh, well, I made the, I unmuted myself first, so I guess here here we go. <laughs> I, I really just uh, I just want to say that I'm very uh, happy to hear that the conversation is 
what I would say sufficiently radical, in other words, radical in terms of going to the root. You know, I was a little bit concerned to say that, you know, that I think that training is necessary but not sufficient. I'm happy to hear that that is understood as a, a baseline and maybe we're going even further, which is to say that, um, in, you know, improved training of police officers who are in reality going to be first responders in many of these situations is not the situation that's not ideal but it is the case now so certainly some reckoning with improving that situation but what I'm thrilled to hear is that we're thinking much bigger than that and that we really are saying we cannot focus our solutions through law enforcement that these are social conversations that these are community decisions and that they have to do with placing resources where resources need to be. I think we should be, of course, um, realistic about that, that once we're talking about specifically a matter of money and saying that we need, you know, I, I, I always oppose the sort of lifeboat mentality, the idea that there's not enough money and so we have, if we're going to provide mental health services, we're going to have to take that money, you know, out of the wallets of police officers. That's not what's happening and I think we should resist that kind of imagery, but at the same time, moving the emphasis back to communities and reducing the role of law enforcement. I just want us to be prepared and aware of the of the pushback to that that we are likely to see and to have our, our, our argument uh, ready, which I think we do, but to, to be aware that um, we're going to need to make an argument that this is a movement towards making people more safe um, and not less safe. And, I, and, and getting uh, our, our argument lined up to do that. But I just wanted to say that I'm very, very happy to hear that the conversation is that far uh, advanced. Um, uh, I, I really am. I, I just want to, I, I, I realize that my, my, my comment sounded like that light bulb mentality and I want to I stress that I, I agree with you. You know, I was thinking about a very specific million dollar grant for trauma in the communities that came to Mayor Emanuel from, um, I think, the Department of Justice. So it's a very, I'm thinking about an actual real million dollars of which almost all of it did not go to the communities that are traumatized but went to police training. So that's not the way it should be, that, but I am thinking about, when I made that comment, I was thinking about that, that not a hypothetical million dollars, but there's an actual million dollars being spent on trauma in the communities and not being spent on the communities of trauma. Um, and I think that's about, as you say, focus, not about life voting, not about, um, not that it has to be a zero sum game, but that um, we have to shift the conversation in that really important way. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I heard you as talking really about the, the narrative and the, way we, and the way we need to shape it, which absolutely is going to be interpreted that way. It is the way that things are often hold, held and we need to be prepared to make that counter argument that we are not trying to um, deprive communities of, of, of law enforcement that's, that's necessary. No, I, this, this, is, this is Ronald Hampton. I think, I think there's an additional case that can be made uh, because there are communities where uh, citizens are getting more involved in the development of public safety strategies that include the services that communities need and should have. So I, I think that there's evidence that what we're talking about can be successful. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions coming in now from our audience members. And just a reminder to our participants, if you do have a question for the panelists, uh, you can type that in the Q&A box over on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if we don't get your question today, um, we will follow up by a um, by an email. You can just send your question to an email address that's in the middle of your screen there. Um, but first, a couple of questions that already came in. Um, and I will throw these out to the group, whoever wants to take them. Um, if you would all like to comment on the question, that's also great too. Uh, so for the, the first question, um, here it is. If you are a person of color with a disability, what strategies uh, can you be equipped with to help mitigate, navigate, or push back on the crosshairs of intersectionality? So sounds like the question is, you know, if you're a person of color with a disability, 
should you be pushing back on this frame of intersectionality? And if so, why or how? Well, I think that's kind of the broader issue that we are that we're getting at, and part of the pushback, of course, is this conversation today. I mean, what we have found is that very often, within uh, organized activity, folks are um, sort of subtly or less subtly encouraged to leave one of their identities, at least one, uh, at the door. You know, um, so when you're in a conversation where you're talking about racism and policing, I think there can be. Um, even among the well-intentioned, there can be a desire to sort of, no, wait, we're just doing, you know, we're just doing blackness now, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to disability later. And that's kind of what I was gesturing towards earlier, where there is a need in all of the spaces that we're in, whether it's as a researcher, whether it's as an activist, to bring your, your full self and to demand acknowledgement for your full self. Um, I, I don't have... There's no recipe for it because it's a it's a difficult conversation, but it does include, you know, raising your hand and saying, okay, but what about people with disabilities also, you know, who are also black, who are also in this conversation, you know, when you are in the conversation about disability, well, what about race also? What about gender also? What about orientation? You have to insert those those um, lines of dialogue into whatever conversation you're in and simply resist the notion that we'll get to that, you know, we'll get to that. Uh, the idea is that we are our full selves all the time, including in interactions with police, that those multi-dimensions are, are part of what is seen by the officer if we're talking about these incidents, you know, and so it really means in every conversation that you're in and every space that you're in making being mindful yourself that you want to represent all of the things that are important to you and um, nobody here is saying that that always goes down easy <laughs> um, some sometimes it doesn't and that's what we mean in terms of difficult conversations but to resist the idea that we can set aside some of ourselves uh, until later because that and that's part of the problem that's uh, you know, that has us in the situation we're at today. I just want to say that there are lots of people, lots of movements and organizations doing this kind of work. And one of the things, you know, I, I try to, as much as possible, stay in my lane as a journalist. So I think about, well, who, who can I quote? Who can I highlight? Who can I profile? Who can I help to get into a mainstream media outlet? That's kind of my lane. But, and there are other ones. But I have been really encouraged, I have to say, over the last year, of both sort of formal and informal work being done around this. Um, uh, the ACLU last week, I think, came out on a, a re report on, um, on, on people with disabilities in, in solitary confinement. That was really led and driven by uh, people of color with disabilities and then, um, you know, in, in, a, in a collective work. The AVID Prison Project, similarly this summer, uh, the National Council on Disability this fall had a had a meeting on first responders and disabilities. Uh, there's the Harriet Tubman Collective is a group I'm really impressed with of, of a, just a, a wonderful collection of activists uh, of all all different sorts uh, with different backgrounds and trainings and and professional skills coming together to sort of demand uh, two way inclusion to, to tell civil rights groups not focused on disability that they have to talk about disability and tell disability rights groups that they have to talk about civil rights. And those kinds of movements are the places I think we really uh, need to be, be focusing. And, and honestly, again, this is sort of what I do this a lot, funding. I talk about money. I think about where are the resources going. And, and, um, and, and, and we need to be funding. We need to be really pushing our attention there to those kinds of things. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, we have some more questions rolling in. Um, are there any efforts to look at training as it relates to people with disabilities and workplace-related incidents? So, for example, police are being called to workplace settings because staff or supervisors feel unnecessarily threatened by an individual, say, with, with mental illness or psychiatric disability. Um, so that's the question. Training about, uh, about that, about related to workplace um, incidents. I don't know if Ron can talk to it. I haven't seen that in particular. Um, the the so the 40-hour CIT class, in which I've sat in on various ones, 
crisis intervention team training is 40 hours long. It's a combination of kind of lectures about what is disability and what it's like to be disabled, um, usually delivered by mental health professionals, and then various kinds of role playing and assessment of role playing, um, usually uh, performed by actors uh, who are not disabled. That's mostly what I've seen around the country. It varies widely from place to place. There are places where people with disabilities are more involved, but it doesn't, I haven't seen anything specifically focused on workplace calls and the, and the root issue, if I'm hearing correctly, the issue behind it that um, what's going on is that someone else's ableist perspective is leading them to be afraid so then they call the police and then the incident escalates. Um, and that kind of more, I guess, sophisticated analysis of, of discrimination uh, is not something that I have witnessed being a, a part of police training uh, on either mental health issues or on developmental disability issues. Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting question and, and some things that people are thinking about too is do we, do we actually target training efforts towards dispatchers um, who are kind of giving information to police officers before they go out on these calls um, about how they might talk about, you know, whatever's being reported on or, or being called about. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing too. Ron and, and David, I didn't know if you had thoughts on that or Janine on well, perhaps training dispatchers. Yeah, this is this is uh, this is Ron. Years and years ago, there was um, some investment in in the dispatch system called managing calls for service, and the intent was to gather for the dispatcher to gather as much information as they as he as she or he could, and then be able to transfer that information to the officer responding during the actual response. Uh, I don't know where that strategy or if that is something that they're using now uh, because now we've seen to a, a reversal in terms of some of the community policing strategies uh, intra-agency and all we're really doing is just responding to calls for service sort of disregarding uh, the information that the officer needs to have in order to adequately and appropriately handle the call once he or she gets there. So I just think that um, uh, the, the kind of things that I was talking about in terms of the community control of the police addresses some of those issues because it begins to look at what the, uh, what the concerns of the people are when they're calling the police. And because there has to really be a comprehensive educational approach to the public when it comes to not just policing but public safety and the agencies that are involved in providing public safety in our community. Uh, dis dispatching is clearly one of the places in which practice really differs. Uh, I spent some time in San Antonio where they have a, a well thought of, uh, where they're really trying to build build from the ground. Uh, they would be the first to say that they're not perfect, but they have built kind of comprehensive mental health services and comprehensive approaches to homelessness and training 100% of their officers and building dedicated teams focused on specific kinds of issues. Again, not perfect, but they are certainly trying to build uh, community-based infrastructure from the ground up to address these issues. And they were very clear on saying one of the things we do is we train everybody, every single person, including dispatchers, who send them out. And if you do, which I don't recommend, but if you do sit down and you read kind of 200 media reports on 200 deaths uh, in a row, you do see how often the bad information starts at the call. So to the extent that we do focus on training, clearly we do need to include dispatchers there. I would only add. Yeah, I saw you nodding there. Oh, sorry. Yes, I would add uh, anecdotally that I have heard uh, advocates in this area say that sometimes what they're dealing with is the fight over who gets to the phone first. In other words, when a person is in particularly a mental health crisis, their family is concerned or there's fighting going on, um, because the family member may be the one who calls, then the person they're calling about is is already framed as the, the perpetrator, 
you know. So when police get there, there may in fact be a sort of general confusion or general fighting going on, but whoever has been named in that initial call to law enforcement, they're the, they're the, the target, if you will, when you get there. So in other words, I, it just speaks to, in other words, an, another um, sort of confused aspect of, of what goes down in that, in that moment, you know. So clearly, the point of intervention has to be sometime before law enforcement arrive at a scene, and I think that's what we're all saying, but I th I'm just underscoring that it's uh, been told to me that that's incredibly impactful. Uh, the, the, the law enforcement arrive with a particular scenario in mind, and that has to do with what they've been told over the phone. Great, thank you. Um, so the, the next, uh, item is more of a comment. It says, I became a police officer in 1977. We are still talking about the same issues. So I think there might also be a question there of why are we still having the same issues that we had in 1977? Uh, also, uh, are you, you're asking me? <laughs> well, I, kind of, I, I threw, I it, think out, threw it out to the front. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the reasons <laughs> is, is that uh, uh, I, I think David alluded to it that, that the people in the, the police community think that it, it is uh, something that that training can can cure, and so they will talk about the additional training, investment in the training, and then we never see the results of the or the change because it's it also has something to do with the culture of policing, and then we also had to take in consideration that. And a lot of this has to do with the culture of the police unions who represent the police officers and the contracts that are negotiated with between management and the, pol and the individual police officers. And the police unions have an awful lot of power in our, in our society. So uh, if, if we're talking about successful change, restructuring, cultural issues, then we're going to have to deal with the unions. And the and the and uh and the things that they fight for in reference to what they think policing ought to be in this country. Yeah. And I think we also have to look uh at the broader social and economic context, you know, in which you have uh, increasing poverty and joblessness, a sort of abandonment of, of city centers, you know, we see the creation the conditions for the creation uh, of poverty and its attendant um, problems, and that it seems that our social response has been increasingly to to criminalize poverty, you know, um, and to turn things into crimes that were never crimes before. So at the same time, as we have individual officers saying we're being asked to handle too much, we're being asked to be social workers and so on, we have a society that is systematically draining uh, the other uh, resources for those sorts of sorts of things. So it's very much the question of law enforcement and the emphasis on law enforcement is absolutely integrated into broader social and economic uh, questions. I just don't, I, I think uh, there's no way to separate it, to separate it from that. Sorry, I just heard um, back from Laurel that she is She's on the phone, so I'm trying to get her up um, online. But in the meantime, just I'll throw out one question about terminology. Um, and the question is, why do we say uh, people with disabilities as opposed to people with differing abilities? Differing abilities versus people with disabilities. David, it sounds like you want to take that one. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, it's, not my, it's not my campaign to fight. I, I, I am dyslexic. But my entry into the disability community comes as the father of a boy with Down syndrome and as an academic trying to study things once he was born and now as a journalist. Um, but I will say that people whose campaign it is to fight um, differ, that there's lots of different terms, um, but that I feel that people like uh, Lawrence Carter Long talking about say the word, say the word disabled, and um, all of the self-advocates behind the Identity First movement who want to not just say, dis who are, want to say not a person with disability, but a disabled person, um, that their arguments have been very persuasive to me. And so I recommend you go look them up.
Okay, great. I'm just trying to get Laurel set up here. So um, what we might do is just take a pause in the kind of the question and answer period and take a step back just to make sure we hear from Laurel. I think she has a really important perspective to share with us um, from Black Lives Matter. So let me kind of just get my gears in order here and we'll, we'll kind of back up for just a little bit. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Laurel while we're getting her set up and then we will turn it over to her. So Laurel Kilpatrick, she is a co-organizer with Black Lives Matter Northwest Indiana Gary chapter and is also a member of the Harriet Tubman Collective. Laurel has been involved in social justice movements since 2000, starting with environmental justice in her hometown of East Chicago, Indiana. Professionally, she's a program coordinator for Everybody Counts North, a disability rights agency and center for independent living in Hammond, Indiana. And she is also an instructor in sociology at Indiana University Northwest. And regarding her views on social justice, Laurel stresses that only a gender inclusive, intergenerational, multiracial, accessible, anti racist movement will secure a true quality of life for everyone. So, with that, let me turn this over to Laurel. Um, so, Laurel, I'm going to unmute you. And I'm going to turn over presenter. Yeah, if I can hear you, I'm going to turn over presenter privileges to you so you can advance your slides. So I'm on my phone and I actually don't have the ability to oh, flip okay. anything over. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. This all happens. No, no very problem. Quickly. Um, do you want me to try to just kind of flip through as you as you talk? Sure. You know, you can. So basically, actually, unfortunately, I'm I'm gonna just kind of jump into the situation as it is. Uh, I'm the program coordinator for Center for Independent Living in uh, Hammond, Indiana, called Everybody Counts North. We're part of Everybody Counts, Inc., which together there's a second center in Maryville, Indiana. I work for the Hammond Center. And we're at right now in Mesa, Arizona at the Silk Congress. And uh, there's a hashtag right now. It's hashtag Silk, S-I-L-T, Congress, E-O-N-G-R-E-S-S, -S, 2017. And basically, uh, Silk is statewide independent living council. Every every state has a statewide independent living council that supplies centers for independent living with the state funding, and they're supposed to be the uh, the body that does the um, the advocate, the legislative advocating on the state level uh, for for these areas for people with disabilities in the state. Um, our issue, our long-standing issue, has been that in Indianapolis, Indiana, and in central and southern Indiana in general, where the majority of the other centers for independent living are, and where the state, uh, the statewide independent living council is, uh, they have no relationship with us in northwest Indiana. Uh, in northwest Indiana, in just one of our counties, in Lake County, uh, is over 47 percent, the highest number, uh, the highest percentage of the minority population of the state is who we serve and that's who we advocate for. And uh, we're very much of uh, the belief that when they shut us out as a center for independence, Are the majority black and Latin people in your area going through? They're refusing. Oh, I got an emergency vehicle. Sorry, guys. Hang on. Let me try to mute that. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Uh, when they shut us out of that process, they're shutting out this demographic of people that we represent. So recently, in the December meeting of the Indiana Statewide Independent Living Council, one of the things they've done to, to attempt to silence us is to cancel public comment. The public comment section is the only section that people not on the council, and it's the only section where they have a chance to voice the concerns of their area. Uh, and they recently uh, canceled public comment altogether because they didn't like what we were saying. They didn't like how the people we were bringing to these meetings were saying it. Uh, and they came up with legislation uh, quite against their own rules that lay out punitive stipulations about if we continue to make statements they weren't comfortable with in public comment, then on the eighth offense, we would be banned for life from making public comments. And in the, in the independent living, um, this, this movement was born out of advocacy, it was born out of activism, it was born out of dissent, it was born out of noncompliance. 
This writing was born out of people with a wide range of disabilities, you know, uh, people who were using wheelchairs, hopping out of their wheelchairs and crawling up the steps, right, of the State House in Washington, D.C. because it wasn't accessible. It was born out of people uh, pushing their bodies under these buses, city bu public buses, because if the bus wasn't going to be accessible for them, then the buses wouldn't roll on the street, period. It was born out of this. And now what we have are people with disabilities and people without, but mostly people with disabilities, using state violence in terms of the police to silence those of us who have to go to these links to advocate for our people because they're not doing it. So this weekend, again, there's a Silk Congress, uh, Center for Independent or Statewide Independent Living Council Congress, uh, in which our, the Indiana Silk gave a report and the report was very vague. Uh, everybody was giving these inspirational reports about what they're doing in their state, um, how they're kind of building a culture, how they're supporting the Centers for Independent Living, what they're getting done on behalf of the people with disabilities in the state. And this, the Statewide Independent Living Council for Indiana gave a very vague presentation because they actually don't do anything for people with disabilities other than the people on that council. And it's very sad. Um, just a little bit about where I'm from. I'm from East Chicago, Indiana. In East Chicago, Indiana, I don't know if you've seen it in national news, they are uh, fighting a, a lead crisis right now. They're fighting a very serious lead crisis in which the city is, uh, I'm sorry, in which the city is trying to forcibly evict populations, uh, the majority of which are people with disabilities, uh, evict them so they can create a, a industrial uh, structures on this land. Uh, if you're from East Chicago, you know you know one thing for sure: you don't drink the water. Uh, we're home to the largest steel uh, domestic steel refinery in the in the st in the country, in East Chicago, Indiana. Um, uh, BP British Petroleum has an oil refinery between East Chicago and Whiting, Indiana. That's the largest domestic oil refinery in the country, it's sitting right between East Chicago and Whiting, Indiana. Um, and it's not a new crisis. People have been suffering and dying uh, from conditions that are related to lead contamination for a very long time. Uh, but all we asked for in October from the Silk was a letter uh, to the mayor, so maybe we can move this issue forward. And they've done nothing, again, because they refuse to advocate for this population of mostly black and Latino people with disabilities. So. Uh, they gave a report yesterday at the Silk Congress and included nothing about our, our area. So I objected loudly and I gave our report because we just found out that there's a right to die legislation that had been introduced by a state senator uh, in our state of Indiana. And, and we just found out that it's been, it's not being supported by, by other representatives, which is a huge victory. It's huge because as we all know, right to die legislation, right to die legislation overwhelmingly negatively affects people with disabilities, overwhelmingly negatively affects women, overwhelmingly negatively affects racial power minorities. We know that. And um, it's, it, we got it to not be supported. And our silk didn't do that. We did that, the Center for Independent Living. The Statewide Independent Living Council did nothing towards that. We did that. And I was speaking to those things that we have done. We've made transportation in our area accessible. We're, we're making moves to get involved in the fight to make public spaces and residential living quarters accessible. And uh, not, not most of the crowd, but probably about five to six people booed and hissed and yelled for us to shut up and leave if we don't like it, supporting the racism and sexism and ableism that we deal with on a monthly basis. Larry Wanger, who I believe is the Silk Chair in, in uh, Arizona, he's a Silk Executive Director in Arizona, uh, I have a visual impairment in my left eye. I'm legally blind in my left eye. He came up to me on my left side, aggressively put his hand on my shoulder and my arm and told me to shut up and leave. So, and this is, this is happening. Um, so because I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a supporter of state violence. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's most things I don't call the police for. And I was well within my right uh, to call the police and have him arrested for assault. Uh, but I didn't because it's a bigger issue, right? It's a bigger issue than my offense. So today, when we had a meeting that Larry Wanger invited us to, um, as opposed to go into this room publicly to say to people, what happened yesterday was wrong, them trying to silence us was wrong, 
people additionally trying to silence us was wrong. He called the police and he lied and told the police that he felt physically threatened and that he wanted us removed from the Congress and the hotel. And as we were trying to figure out what was going on, why four hotel security guards pulled us out of a room, six to eight cops, armed cops, <laughs> came into the area and circled all of us. So let me give you a picture. I, I myself uh, don't use a chair, but I'm visually impaired. I have a coworker, again, um, legally blind, uses a cane. Uh, my executive director, a uh, Puerto Rican woman, uses uh, is hearing impaired and uses um, a scooter. My other coworker, a black woman, uses a wheelchair. Our consultant, a uh, middle-aged white male, uses a wheelchair. We are who he felt physically threatened by. They called the police to have us removed. They called the police to have us physically removed. So they called the police to have us physically removed. And it was so funny because the police were asking who were the ones being the most vocal because they equated us using our voice to advocate for our people with us being violent and with us needing to be removed from the situation. So. And I'm also an organizer for Black Lives Matter, Northwest Indiana, Gary. And uh, in the slides, I'm not sure if you all can see the slides. I, I make mention. I make mention of our. I make mention of our uh, seven demands for the city. We focus on three of those demands: the immediate uh, stoppage of uh, county sweeps. That's when the county and city police come into the area and affect um, arrest warrants, no matter how old they are, and they forcibly enter people's residence and usually don't announce themselves as police in the beginning, and it, it's terrorism. Uh, we focus on the immediate stoppage of what we call predatory finding. Uh, just like in Ferguson, I don't know if people saw the documentary, Ferguson, a city under siege, where they talked about how uh, the residents of Ferguson are under constant economic terrorism by being uh, subjected to these vehicle fines, these uh, motor vehicle fines for their cars, totaling in the thousands of dollars. Uh, such as the situation with Gary, Indiana, except with the um, democratically elected officials of Gary, the mayor particularly has done, has sold the people of Gary, Indiana to other cities, meaning they've allowed the police departments of other cities to come into Gary and ticket people. Uh, and by the way, the Lake County Sheriff, uh, Gary is in Lake County, the Sheriff of Lake County, Indiana, is being indicted on charges of uh, taking bribes, particularly by a tow truck agency and has been recorded on tape saying, well, if you're not getting the number of polls that you need, go to Gary. So he's been saying that Gary is a, a overwhelmingly uh, black population city. Uh, the most populous, second most populous city in the state, by the way. And again, part of the area that we, that we advocate for is a center for independent living. Uh, so we, we use some of, the same, some of the same tactics to use our voice to use our community building to get people together to fight state violence. And so the reason why I'm so late today, again, is because I had to be very vigilant by recording what was going on because it was getting so bad. Um, there was an officer who, when I said I was recording, he asked me why. I said, I'm recording to make sure that our rights are not violated because there's eight of you, there's five of us, and we all have disabilities. And he pointed to his body cam and said, well, we're recording it. We have body cams. And I said, yeah, but you see in the news that, you know, black people with disabilities are being killed by the cops all the time on camera. So that's not going to stop you from violating our rights. And he laughed. And my executive director asked him, is he laughing at, at, at black disabled people dying? And he said, yes, I'm laughing. So uh, I apologize for being late, but there was no way I was going to take my camera off of any of them for any amount of time. Um, I also called the sergeant, you know, I was making another comment, and I said that you all are the militarized arm of the government. You all are the militarized arm of the government, and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do when one of the officers tried to feed being disconnected from the issue, only doing their jobs. And the sergeant asked me if I was calling him the militarized arm of the government. And I said, absolutely, that's what you are. That's, that's like almost the definition uh, of your occupation. You should read about the history of cops in this country as slave catchers in the, in the South and as uh, union busters and the abusers of immigrants and immigrant labor in the North. And he pointed at me and told his fellow officers to remove me on the spot. He said, she goes right now off the premises. So absolutely, that's why I know we're talking specifically about, about police abuse, but when, for me, police abuse is just one form of state violence among many forms that, that I face in my activism. 
So you have cops, you have uh, the courts, absolutely you have the courts. And I don't call it a criminal justice system because there's no justice to it. So you have the cops, you have the courts, and now I think we're seeing with Trump, you have the usage of these uh, racist groups. You know, they use these racist groups to attack people and to violate people. And they're very much used as part of uh, their political game to oppress people. So that's why I talk about state violence uh, as opposed to just policing. And, and now, again, in independent living, which is supposed to be a movement uh, created by people with disabilities, they're using state violence. Uh, the, the, the statewide independent living council called the police on us regularly, monthly. They called the police on a 16-year-old African American girl. Her name is Sarah Gould, and you can hashtag, uh, hash, or you can look up the hashtag. It's hashtag S A R A Gould, G O U L D. Hashtag Sarah Gould, who was reading a letter about intersectionality and inclusion that I wrote because I couldn't be at the meeting, and she went over an arbitrary five-minute time limit and they called an armed state patrol officer to remove her. And, you know, that situation could have gone horribly. We've all seen video footage of police officers manhandling young girls, you know, not even talking about grown adult men or young men. We've seen them manhandling young black girls. So that situation could have been tragic. So, you know, this, and this just happens to be, so this young girl was reading a letter that I wrote. Um, she's associated with our center. She's the granddaughter of uh, one of my coworkers. Uh, yeah, and this police officer came up to her, and I tell you what, she did better than most adults. She continued reading that letter. She finished She finished that letter, and the people on the council was beside themselves that the cop didn't physically remove her, but the cop was kind of freaked out, too. He, he wasn't going to touch her. And as a matter of fact, afterwards, when he walked past her, he touched her shoulder as if to comfort her and then apologized to the adults who brought her afterwards and said, I didn't want to do that. I was just doing my job. So this is what happens. You know, this is how state violence is used in the independent living community against people with disabilities who are trying to do true advocacy, who are trying to actually make a difference, and really at the end of the day, who are just trying to make people do their jobs. And it's the same work that groups like Black Lives Matter is doing. I'm a part of the Harriet Tubman Collective. It's the same work that we're doing. And again, without the benefit of the, the appointed state entity, we help. Uh, we help politicians withdraw their support for an end-of-life legislation in Indiana, which is huge. It's huge. You know, people like my grandmother, people like my aunt are the types of folks that would choose to end their own lives rather than be what we as a society call a burden on their family members to take care of them. So I don't know. That's all I have. I'm sorry I was rambling on, and this really isn't the presentation that I planned but uh, it's the presentation that happened as a result of the day. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laurel. We really appreciate um, you coming in and, and sharing that perspective with us and kind of bringing us back to, you know, the, the real difficulty and struggle at the grassroots level of what's happening out there. Um, so thank you again. Um, so I thought I would just kind of check back in with the other panelists now that we've kind of had some more kind of information brought into the space. I just thought I would check in with you guys to see if you wanted to respond to anything Lorel mentioned um, to interact with each other a little bit more, or I can kind of head back into to questions. So panelists, let me know what you think. And don't forget to unmute yourselves. Well, this is Janine. Um, I, I wanted to definitely to, to thank Laurel for, for that information and for that, um, for telling us about that experience. It's very powerful to hear and, and I don't have much to say in response except to say that it certainly illustrates how dangerous ideas are. Um, and the, the many of the examples, you know, the idea of who's the most vocal, that's the person who needs to leave. All of these are just so emblematic of the difficulty of the work and the way that it will be resisted, you know. But what I really first wanted to say that I take away is the positive vision that's articulated there. In other words, of the organization where, where organizations tasked with certain things are not doing those jobs, I'm hearing that other groups of individuals are springing up and are filling those cracks to do, uh, you know, to, to fulfill the work that that organization is meant to do and is not fulfilling, and that's very inspiring to me. But also the positive vision 
which I've long admired, of the independent living community in general, which is about sharing a view of what the world could look like, of what our society could be if people were allowed the resources and the freedom to live the lives that they want to live. And the idea that that can be one in which community helps community and there is less and less role for police, you know, makes absolute sense to me. But so despite the the difficulty, clearly, um, the physical challenge and the the resistance that you meet, what I actually took from that was a very positive vision of a, of a way forward and of a way that we can help one another forward with a, a vision that's not just about what we want to end, but what we want to grow. Uh, and so I was just very, very uh, inspired by that. Thank you. All right, and Laurel, you mentioned something that um, one of the other panelists brought up, and that was the use of body cameras and recording, you know, behavior, whether that's behavior by police officers or by the community. Um, just throwing this out to the panelists at large, like, what are your kind of thoughts or views on on recording devices or body cameras, both on the community side, but also on the policing side? And do you think there's um, there's room for that in our in our solutions moving forward to this issue. Oh, I think um, I think that what we know now, and and so it's not, and it's very important that we that I verbalize it. It's not my opinion. It's what we know. It's what we've been able to observe. We know that body cameras on police officers and dash cams don't stop them from abusing and killing people. You know, they abuse and kill people in in the uh, in their police departments and they're being recorded. So that doesn't stop them. On the on the side of civilians and people who are advocates and activists, I think it's imperative that we continue to record. Um, I'm, I'm going to put together all of these all of these recordings because I had to use other people's phones to record in Facebook Live when mine died. Excuse me. I'm losing my voice. I came I came to Arizona sick as it was, and I'm losing my voice. I had to use other people's phones to continue to record because they did pose a threat. I mean, they posed a threat to my life. And after I let the, let the officers know that I know they're posing a threat to my life, you know, this is state violence that they're using, you know, the sergeant and another other officers became extremely aggressive. After the sergeant said, get her out, and pointed to me and told him to get me out right then, the, the officer that laughed when I told him about, you know, your body camera doesn't mean anything because, you know, people of color with disabilities are getting killed, he laughed. And so when the sergeant told him to get me out, he was gleeful, and that's the only way I can describe it. He was gleeful that he was going to get a chance to maybe put his hands on me and get me out of there. It was, I mean, it, it, of course it's scary. It's scary, right? But I think that when you're in the moment, and, and, and I've been in quite a few moments where I've, I've faced down police. You know, I've been to Ferguson. I've faced down police. You know, I broke down my last wall of believing in, in this democracy and this, this constitution that protects people. I did. This is when the police attacked us and all we were doing was chanting, you know, so that, that barrier, that last barrier, that last symbolism of safety has been broken. But, um, but yeah, so I, um, I think it's imperative that people make record of their interactions, uh, any interaction like this. Um, I think it's imperative that they continue to record. Uh, even though in places like Chicago, recording the police is now an arrestable offense. I don't know if it's a felony, but it's a, I think it's, I think it's a, at least a misdemeanor and an arrestable offense to record the police without their consent of doing their job. And these are all laws made to thwart activism, of course. Uh, because, of course, it doesn't, even though the cops haven't really, even though the cops really in the courts don't discipline them when they kill people and they're on, they're on tape, it still makes it harder for them to do, it still provides a, a semblance of a barrier. So I think people should still do it, absolutely. I think they should continue to record and continue to, to put things on on tape and document it and, and audio record it too. If you don't have a video recorder, audio record it and then release it to the public. That's important. Don't keep it to yourself. Release it to the public. That's why Facebook Live uh, become kind of invaluable in like live stream and Ustream. Um, it's invaluable to be able to record them and then immediately release it. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. I, I just want to jump in and say there's a difference between monitoring and surveillance, and that it's very easy for body cameras and dash cams to become tools of surveillance rather than tools of monitoring. Um, 
I don't think it has to work that way. Again, I'm always concerned about cost. I'm concerned about funneling more resources into police rather than into communities. Um, video has enormous power, and um, even if it doesn't result in convictions, it does result in um, allowing people to witness what goes on. And um, but and but again, but but just as Laurel says, when video is just a tool controlled by uh, the legal and uh, carceral and uh, system. It's, it doesn't feel like a, a strong pathway to liberation. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm opposed to body cameras, but that I'm just very uh, skeptical that they're a big pathway uh, to, to getting us to a better place. And, and no, this is Laurel. No, they're not. They're not a path. I mean, we, they kill people on camera. That's the experience that they have. They kill people on camera. Like everything else, it's a concession, but it's not even a concession that works for the people. And that's why I talk about state violence as opposed to just police. It's all a part of state violence. The cops work in concert with the cops. It's, it's all state violence. But no, I don't think it's, no, it's not meant to be a tool for liberation for people at all. Yeah. I mean, Walter Scott was killed on camera. The officer was shown planting his weapon, and he was still, there was a mistrial. So I'm not particularly optimistic about uh, the power of video in the courts at this moment. Okay, thank you both for your, um, for your thoughts on that. A couple of people have mentioned or um, have said in the kind of the Q&A box that maybe police in their jurisdictions are creating databases of quote unquote vulnerable people. Um, and I just thought I would ask you guys to weigh in on whether, you know, creating databases of people who have disabilities or within the police um, kind of structure is a solution or um, if not, what some of the pitfalls might be by creating that sort of database. Well, I, mean, I know I, that in our area, I know that in our area, when you go to the doctor, to Laurel, in our area, when you go to the doctor and you're blind, they, they create a, there is a list, there is a database of all of uh, the blind folks, at least I know that in Indiana. And I, I tell you the truth, I haven't gotten a satisfactory answer when I asked why. Why do they need a record of where all the blind people are? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but they do. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, I, I, I think, it, and I, I, again, I can't imagine why, but I think it's just one more step is failing people. I think it's just, again, state violence. I think it's just another tool um, of the power elite just to know where we are. There's a database of people who own guns. There's a database of uh, parents of children with certain disabilities. There's a database of people with certain disabilities. I think it's just another one of those ways where they could just keep a very tight hold on people. I didn't get my So not the most sophisticated answer, but the one that I've come up with so far. You know, I, I was recently talking with a bunch of people in Iowa, and uh, I generally am very skeptical about these kinds of databases, too. But one of the people there, she's a person with a mental disability, a woman of color, um, frequently has been homeless. And she said that when she gets pulled over by the cops, yeah, she'd be pretty happy if, she, if the cops knew ahead of time about her disabilities. So um, I just feel like that's a perspective a lot of people have, but it's perspective based on fear, right? It's a perspective based on knowing that if you don't have some kind of uh, reason for the cops not to abuse you, that you could be in a lot of danger. So um, in the short term, if people who are deaf want to hang a placard on their car saying, I'm deaf, please don't assume I'm ignoring you and shoot me, or someone would like to be in a database saying, hey, I could be in a mental health crisis, please don't assume I'm ignoring you and shoot me, that comes out of fear, and it might be a helpful short-term solution, maybe. maybe probably not, but maybe in an individual incident. But it, again, is not um, it's not getting at that route uh, that Janine was talking about earlier. And we really do have to get there. Yeah, this is Ron. And Janine I'm, and Ron, uh, did you want to weigh in on this? Oh, there you are, Ron. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, no, I have to agree. I'm not, I'm not a, 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 in favor of creating databases. They they backfired on so-called people involved in gangs. Uh, they backfired on uh, during the times of the Cointel Pro. So they can too easily be used against, against you rather than provide a, a measure of safety for you. And like David was talking about, sometimes people res want to resort to those kind of things, thinking that that's going to protect them. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, I just don't think that that trust level exists 
uh, with with these uh, law enforcement agencies and and, and civilians. So I, I I know I wouldn't want my name in uh, in in a database. Uh, I would just just to agree with what has been said. I have the same uh, reaction of of intense uh, suspicion for the idea of a collection of of names coded in certain ways. Um, I understand the the idea, but to me. First of all, disability manifests itself so differently in so many different situations or can do that the idea that police officers would then say, oh, well, let me check this person's name, you know, that they're in the, in the heat of an interaction and that then would change their behavior, you know, their behavior should be what it should be, you know, regardless of whether the person is actually coded as, as having a disability of some sort. So I, I, I'm suspicious of it for the surveillance mechanism, but I'm also suspicious of it in terms of moment-to-moment -moment help. I think in many situations where people are repeatedly involved with law enforcement, law enforcement do come to know that person. You know, they, they do know that this is a person who, you know, in certain circumstances will be uh, you know be, might be considered disturbing the peace or something like that, and in small towns certainly that's that can be the case. Uh, I don't think you can substitute for that personal community knowledge, or should we, uh, on the part of law enforcement? And then in the broader picture, uh, I just don't see I, the potential for abuse of that information seems to me uh, overpowering. So there are a couple of reasons that I that I have questions on that. So I just wanted to say real quickly, there's an issue. A young man named Stefan Watts who lived in Calumet City, young autistic, 14 uh, or 15 year old. Uh, the police were doing, a, um, well, they said the police officer, it's usually a security or usually a social worker, was doing a, an assistance call for the parents because Stefan had gotten agitated. It was time to go to school. He wanted to play on his computer. Um, they came in. Um, they, they already knew that Stefan was autistic and they already knew his triggers and they triggered him. They were loud, they were lights, they were yelling. Stefan had a butter knife in his, hand, in his hand because he was trying to open a cabinet with a computer in it. And uh, the officers chased him down to his basement. One officer shot him in the back. He turned around, the other officer shot him in the chest and they killed him. Most recently in an in a action in Chicago by some grassroots organizations, <clears throat> The police uh, hit Stefan Watts' mother with a bike. They were trying to pin people physically in an area, and they hit Stefan Watts' mother with a bike. A young man came to her assistance, putting his body between the police officers and Ms. And Ms. Watts, and that young man was arrested. Uh, he, he put his body between the bike. The police officer hit him with the bike. He fell over, fell into the bike. They arrested him and charged him with two felonies, $100,000 bail. So absolutely, you know, they, they already know. They already know who, you know, if we all have done any activism whatsoever, you know, they already have these, these categories, these lists of people, and they use it. And they use this against Stefan to do uh, such a horrific uh, media uh, hatchet job on, on his character, saying that he was, you know, you know, the media used the word crazy, crazy autistic black boy. You know, said so that he was known to try to beat up police. This is, couldn't be farther from the truth. So I absolutely agree with uh, what was being said. And oh, I just want to say February 1st is going to be the five year anniversary of Stefan's murder by the Calumet City Police. And uh, his mother and his family are putting together an anniversary rally in March. So, so look out for that. Hashtag justice for Stefan Watts. Thank you so much, Laurel. Um, we're coming to kind of a close in our webinar here. I'm going to have one more question for each of our panelists. Um, but I just quickly wanted to remind our participants that if we don't get to your question um, right now in the webinar, we will follow up with you via email and try to get that question answered. I also wanted to remind people that this is only the first webinar in a series on the same topic, policing people with disabilities. Um, so make sure you tune in for our next, our next two webinars in the series. The next one will be in May. And there is a link to register for that in the chat box. I posted it there. Or you can also get it later from the PowerPoint slides once they're posted. So I just wanted to point um, both of those things out. And just a reminder, you know, this um, webinar has been very much about the overarching problem and like what is happening, uh, kind of looking at the issue in an intersectional way. And we're really going to try to get into some potential solutions and programs and things that are happening around the country in the next couple of webinars to see if 
to see if we can kind of figure out some of the solutions to this problem. Um, so just a quick reminder on each of those. And with that, I wanted to ask the panelists one final question, and that is if people are listening to the webinar and they want to get involved um, and they want to help out with this issue, um, what can they do? Are there concrete things that they can do, you know, to help with this, to help um, advocate in this space? So I will, I will open that up to the panelists. I'm sorry, the question was, what are some concrete things that you can do? I'm sorry, can you briefly repeat that? That, that people can do, um, people who are listening. So we have, you know, advocates on the phone, we have police, we have family members, we have people with disabilities themselves. You know, do you, um, do the panelists have suggestions for people on things they might be able to do to contribute um, or help this issue? Um, kind of a related question is, are there things people need to do differently given the new administration that's coming in that's also come up several times in questions? So you can either take either of those tags. Oh, so I'll, I'll say first because unfortunately I have to go where I've, I've been in the cab for that whole conversation. But um, I think what people can do is use their voice. Uh, while there were definitely people trying to silence us today, there was an amazing show from a few people of support using their voice, using their presence to speak out against it. I think that a lot of times people who are not sure how to help often default to they're trying to just listen. They're trying to just ed educate themselves and listen to the issues. And there's a time for that, for sure. There's a time and a place for that. But when you are witnessing abuse happening, whether it be physical or verbal or anything, when you're witnessing it happening, you must use your voice. You must try to intervene. Follow the lead of the people who are being abused. We have to take this ideology of support, and I don't really do allyship. I wrote a piece for, for Harriet uh, about um, how, you know, uh, we have to be more than allies. We have to be more than an ally. We have to act. We have to understand that even though you may be able-bodied, you are still affected by the, all of the things that are related to ableism, absolutely racism, uh, classism, sexism. You have to act. And that's the one thing I guess I want to get across is that people have to act. You have to use your voice, use your body, um, use your support. Do something on behalf of people who are abused. And I'm so sorry, but people can contact me. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You can follow me at Kilpatrick, L-D. That's K-I-L, Patrick, L-D. Uh, or reach me by email. Uh, but following me by Twitter is the quickest way to get a hold of me. And I'm so sorry that I have to go, but some of this excitement is still going on. Thank you so much, everybody, for being so patient. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Laurel. Thank you. Um, other panelists, Janine, uh, David, Ron. Well, this is Ron. I, I, I agree with 100% uh, uh, of what she said. It's very important. I, the only thing I would add to it, what I think she's talking about also, is the idea that if you're in all organizations, like here in D.C., the D.C. Autism Society, other organizations, you have to in your work around advocating for the concerns and issues affecting your group, develop strategies within the group to protect the group as well as to address the issues that you're confronting every single day. Uh, because it doesn't help us to talk about uh, what what we've been talking about today if we somehow never don't have a strategy in our organization to address the inappropriate response of the police as well as other uh, agencies in our society, institution. So we're constantly looking at that ourselves and replacing it with a step-up strategy. You know, we, we're saying that we can protect one another. We have children. Uh, mine is 32. There are other families' children are in their 40s. And so we know what to do. You can call on us. We can be our best, uh, our best advocate as well as our support on these kind of issues. And so we need to work across the community to provide that measure of safety and support to uh, our members. So we, that's always something we can do in organizations. I'll, I, I would just like to underscore, if I could, the importance of action, uh, but also to underscore the importance of getting involved at the level that you care about, at the level that you're working at, and not imagining that you need to you know, learn a whole issue area that you know nothing about or travel and join an organization that's in a, another place. You can get involved and there is work to do 
at the areas in which you're already involved. It might be your child's school. It might be your workplace, as came up earlier. All of these are, are places of intervention. And it's not the same thing as just putting out a post on social media about it. It needs to be engagement where you are talking to other people and involved in an actual conversation. It's much harder, but it's where the work actually happens. And then as a media critic, I would underscore writing letters to the editor, writing, trying your hand at an op-ed, particularly in a local paper. You know, where you see coverage that upsets you, respond to it. Talk back to journalists. Uh, I, I think David, I see David nodding his head with me on that. But it is beyond thinking about it and talking with your friends, but it's not as hard or scary as you might think. It's just taking that first step. Hey, you pass a demonstration, grab a flyer. Who's the group that's organizing this? When is their next meeting? Taking a few steps to get involved with other human beings in your community is not only going to be the important work that moves us all forward, but it makes you feel better at the end of the day because you come into community with other people who are who are pushing that same rock. So do get involved in an active way. Thanks, Jenny. David? I just, I'll address the, the new administration issue. I, I think there have been a lot of people in general in the police reform who have been looking for uh, President Obama to fix this. The problem is there. We all see the problem. Why can't he or the, his Department of Justice fix this? Well, that's a big conversation we could talk about another day. Um, but clearly that kind of attitude will not uh, carry forward. It does not feel that Jeff Sessions, assuming he becomes Attorney General, is going to be deeply committed to um, restorative justice or police reform around an intersectional approach to human rights or any of the other kinds of issues that at least people like me have been concerned about and have genuinely found lots of support in the White House for. Um, so we're going to have to do, just as everyone is saying, really look to your local communities, look on your local levels, and stop uh, stop hoping that, that the White House is going to be the leader on these issues because I think we're going to see something very much to the contrary. That's right. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to just take the time to thank each of our panelists, um, Ron, David, Janine, and Laurel. Thank you so much. And of course, I wanted to thank our audience for participating, um, for sharing those great questions and comments. And we will follow up with you um, if we did not get to your question during today's webinar. Also, don't forget, at the end of the webinar, you should see a brief survey that will pop up about, uh, about the webinar and about if you have suggestions for future webinars for us, so do take just a few minutes to fill that out. It's really, really helpful. And with that, thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next webinar in May. Thank you.